Now we get to open up the conversation to those of you in the audience. Does anybody in the audience, would anybody in the audience like to go ahead and ask a question? Yes. Uh, yeah, hello, my name is uh, Jason Schumacher and um, my question is, what do we do to our understanding of eugenics and coarse sterilization by essentially denouncing it? Um, how does it shape our historical understanding and can we make um, a positivist, of, I guess, evaluation of this? So, Mark, would you like to actually take that one on? Uh, we make it completely useless in analyzing contemporary public policy activities. Uh, we throw it into a trash can of history and uh, denounce it in such a way that we're not able to extract lessons from it that allow us to see its ongoing effects in everyday life. Uh, and I think the, the most effective way of doing this is by attaching it firmly to the Nazis. Um, from 1945 to 1965, there appears to be little or no American um, recognition of a relationship between eugenics and the Nazis and the American eugenics movement. It seems to have been um, produced with the um, emerging American understanding and American appreciation of what eugenics was, uh, excuse me, of what the Holocaust was, um, a production of the, the notion of the capital T Holocaust. Um, and that's not to in any way empower anybody who claims that there wasn't a Holocaust, uh, but rather to say that Americans had to understand the Holocaust as a, um, a historical event and to um, attach to it a, a set of meanings that by the mid and late 1960s had acquired particular kinds of meanings. So we, um, as eugenics, when, when we, we've had to try and figure out how it is that eugenics came to become such a slur, and, and I think historians have largely figured that out in the late, it happened in the late 60s and early 70s, and it looks like we just sort of stopped talking about it for about 20 years. It reemerged in the 80s as a topic of discussion with um, ELSI, the Ethical, Legal, and Social Issues Associated with the Human Genome Project, especially in the 90s, where there's funding uh, available for it. And we're talking about it today, but it's so firmly attached to things that we find so despicable that it's difficult for us to look at what are often very well-meaning progressives' activities and extract from it um, lessons for ourselves and the kinds of um, dangers there are for anybody who does anything in public policy. You're, it's very difficult to make public policy without imposing on it, um, imposing on it worldviews that we will later decide are, are either mistakes or even disastrous. And so, what I think people like, uh, uh, people like all of the. Uh, um, professionals who work on the history of eugenics have to do is simultaneously say, oh my God, this is horrible. This is really, really rotten. And really highlight just how bad it was and actually show, you know, this is not unlike other things that we universally believe were horrible. And then at the same time say, but you know, what they're doing is so similar to, and, and often rooted in some of the same foundational notions that we today not only support, but and sometimes, hold, sometimes even hold dear. So you have this very tricky sort of thing. It's what I call gee whiz history about eugenics, which is like, did you know? Kind of history about eugenics on the one hand, and then the other is, it's really not that alien to many of the kinds of things that are going on today. Um, things like what Michael spoke about. Um, there's a significant underlying set of assumptions that are parallel to what motivated the eugenics movement in current reproductive discourse. Um, but it's been um, completely detached from um, governmental oversight and now operates in a kind of wild west laissez-faire activity in which these assumptions are really allowed to run amok without, without critical evaluation. And my real worry is that when we condemn it, we really are incapable of extracting any real meaning from it. Right? It just becomes something, oh my God, ugh. So we have to juggle this thing, and, and honestly, I don't know how to do it. I don't know how to make it synthetic. Does anybody else in the panel want to address that? Well, I just think that also when, we, when we're denouncing it, we have to be careful uh, not to, as I, I sort of alluded to in my talk, not to, to limit ourselves to sort of seeing eugenics as a sort of racist or classist policy, um, but rather as, it was seen sort of as legitimate science in its time and also uh, 
uh, as sort of a progressive measure. And we have to, I think, bear in mind the importance of disability to the history of eugenics and to sort of current sort of what some people might consider neo-eugenic uh, uh, policies. I mean, the, the Nazis, before um, they began uh, exterminating Jews, uh, were first sterilizing uh, and then euthanizing people who were considered to be disabled. Uh, and they got those ideas from the United States. U.S. Laughlin and others visited Germany. German uh, scientists were visiting the United States in the early 20th century. Uh, and this was initially a program, the T4 program, was to sterilize and then eliminate people who were considered to be disabled. The Nazis sterilized 405,000 people in about six years um, and, and then began to euthanize them at the end of the 1930s. Um, and so I think we need to, to when we denounce it, we also need to sort of also think about why and how we're denouncing eugenics. Mm. Good. I, can I? Yeah. Um, I may have a little bit of a, of a different take um, on the question. Um, I think coming from a particular community um, in, in which sterilization is the norm, you no, know, is you have your child, you go and you get sterilized. You, everybody, I go home, everybody's like, why haven't you? What's going on? You, know, you go, go out, give birth and sterilize yourself. Where this is, has become the cultural norm of family organization, um, especially for uh, laboring women and laboring families. Um, it is crucial to have a denunciation of what is what has sterilization has done, because unfortunately it has precluded a conversation about sexual education, about the multiplicity of ways in which women can. Uh, have control over their bodies instead of you have this, you go and get sterilized. So I think that 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 in that in, in coming from this particular perspective, then I need that denunciation. Hmm. Hmm. Good. Wonderful. Now I saw uh, your hand was up over here. I'm Dr. Janice Loxo, and I teach at UW Tacoma Social Welfare History, where I talk about eugenics and the social work program. Um, so my question, first just some context, starting in the 1970s in Texas, I was a social worker, and I happened, my first job was at a state school for what was called the mentally retarded, and it was a very interesting time, as it turns out, and so one of the issues then was, eventually I had some clients who were very high functioning, probably borderline, developmentally disabled, and they actually were wanting to have a sterilization. But because of some court cases that had just happened, they were actually not allowed to do so. And then when it was brought up about it now, in the, you know, this age, we have reproductive technologies, we might be pressuring people to uh, have abortions uh, because there's going to be a child with a disability. And so it really gets, I think it just speaks to the complexity of what we're talking about, how to prevent abuses, but how also to allow choice. And so I just wanted to see if anyone had comments on that. Hmm. Wonderful. Who would like to actually address this? I could refer you to some sources. <laughs> Joanna Schoen's book is yeah. really good with that. Mark mentioned that. And also this new book by Kluchin that fit to be tied, um, they, they address those issues specifically about, and I think it's one of the things we have to consider too, and um, when we're writing the history of eugenics, we can't always sort of see it as sort of patriarchal control and, and the victimization of certain groups or, or women. Um, we have to realize the complexities of it, which makes it very difficult, I think, um, to think about and talk about, but, but I think it's absolutely necessary that we do that, um, and I don't really have a, a good answer, but I can refer you to those two sources. Oh, I can go after that. Oh, okay. Uh, the uh, we'll, we'll have this question, and then we have two questions down here. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so Speaking my name is Andy, and I'm a student at the University of Washington. And my interest at this point concerns citizenship rights and the implications of institutionalization and segregation of people with cognitive cognitive impairments. Specifically, I'm looking at the Fircrest Institution and similar 
places in Washington State. And my question is moving away from forced sterilization and towards a more, the more modern practice of institutionalization and segregation, what implications does eugenics or did eugenics have in the practice of um, installing institutions and what is your knowledge of any political um, implications for preventing deinstitutionalization in Washington State? Okay, good. So this is about more specifically about the institutional context yeah. of genetics. Good. I think I can address, I can't give you a coherent answer, but I can sort of throw some, um, so throw some things at you that might, that might, something might stick. Uh, we, if we talk about eugenics as a discrete thing that sort of somehow emerged um, as a concept in the 1880s and then as a public policy in the United States beginning in about 1904, I think we miss a broader context that enables it, and that broader context is what it seems you're interested in, which are the, the rising use of um, uh, commitment laws starting in the, in the mid and late 19th century, in which uh, first legislatures and then courts, um, in the context of public health and civil order, um, allow for a series of um, increasingly uh, strict or increasingly powerful um, uh, tools for local and state authorities to use to commit people either because they have communicable diseases and they're being quarantined in a, a pre-vaccine era or a, an era before vaccines were available for some of these these ailments or because they had um, uh, they were considered a threat to the community because they had communicable behaviors um, that is they were um, uh, overtly sexually active or they uh, appeared to be incapable of functioning in an open society because of um, cognitive problems. And so we see an increasing institutionalization and quarantining of these people and, and the ability of the state to sort of take that person out of society um, using a religious metaphor to sort of excommunicate them from society and, 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 and compartmentalize them, which then provides a venue for an increasing need for these uh, institutions, first in the form of things like colonies, um, and then in the form of sex-segregated um, institutions. And one of the, um, you know, Davenport's names come up a couple of times, Charles Davenport's names come up a couple of times. The interesting thing about Davenport, and it's, it's generally overlooked, is that Davenport opposed compulsory sterilization in the United States. He was, he was clearly overtly opposed to it. And in a New York State court case, in which he was the expert witness, he said we ought not be compulsory, compulsorily sterilizing people. And in um, heredity and its relation to eugenics, uh, he overtly said coerced sterilization is a bad idea. It's a bad idea for both these practical and um, scientific uh, reasons. The practical purpose is, is it really does run counter to notions of liberty in America. And he was worried about a backlash against um, eugenics and, and this sort of um, uh, very early genetics community uh, if people's, people perceive that their rights are being trampled and that there are abuses of it. What he, uh, and the second reason he said is <clears throat> we don't have, even though Davenport's generally vilified as sort of all nature and zero nurture, he says point blank in heredity in relation, uh, in, in relation to eugenics that uh, we really don't have a, a clear understanding of what is environmentally caused and what's genetic. And really the only way to, to know is to take somebody who has, is somehow behaviorally or physically or mentally problematic, put them into an institution, make sure they have proper nutrition, make sure they have proper education, make sure they have the proper professional care, and then you'll find out if they're really truly biologically, he said, inferior, or if they just had, this was just the result of an inferior um, uh, um, environment. And the language here is repugnant, and I, and I recognize that. I'm just trying to convey Davenport's worldview. Um, and so for Davenport and others like him, the existence of these sterilization laws were, off, were, were uh, um, a fulcrum against which he could lever increasing funds for things like sex segregated institutions. So in the context of these commitment laws, the sex segregated institutions became a, a really important and viable alternative. Of course, as it became increasingly expensive, as Joanna said, um, we uh, sought to use the sterilization um, <coughs> Uh, procedures to try and get people out of them because we thought, well, if they're sterilized and we could release them with some degree of safety into the community, they wouldn't procreate and cause additional burdens on us. Um, but I, I think you're right to look at that stuff. 
about the commitment and the um, quarantine laws in the 19th century that provide the legal and um, sort of uh, intellectual framework necessary for eugenics to step in. Because it doesn't just step into this, to this virgin territory. It steps into this increasing authority of the state to control our individual lives. Okay. Wonderful. Did you want to go ahead? Yes. My name is Barbara Hathaway, and I'm the assistant to Washington State Independent Living Council. And my question is, I'm wondering, well, it's connected with the history of people who are uh, disabled in Europe during World War II, when, and they escaped and came here to the United States. And I'm wondering uh, if, if there are any records of, if there's any records of the sterilization or not of people, if there's any evidence that you found that they were allowed into the U.S. when they came here, if they were, weren't sterilized, if they were allowed. So is there any evidence that they had to be sterilized to come to the United States, people who are disabled and uh, fleeing Europe at the time? Wonderful. Would anybody on the panel be able to address that? Does anybody have any uh, information. information on this, on the panel, on their work? No. Joanne, have you, have you encountered anything with this? No, I have not. Uh. Good, good research question. Yeah. Certainly there were a number of uh, immigrants came into the U.S. When the immigrants came into the U.S., they were uh, scanned to see if they were feeble-minded or not, but nobody checked into whether they were sterilized. Most people who were sent back to Europe actually had communicable illnesses like TB and things like that. And you are? Oh, I'm Bob Rest, a uh, genetic counselor. Yeah, and, and, and Bob will be on the panel this afternoon. Actually. Yeah, and, and I can't speak as much to the post-war period, but I know that in the, the early 20th century, um, many, and I'm sure as we all know, many of the immigrants were, were quarantined at Ellis Island and, and forced to, they were subjected to tests and evaluations and all sorts of things. And, some of them were quarantined for, for several weeks or a couple of months, and others were actually forced to, to leave and return to Europe. Thank you. So we have uh, over here, and then, um, and then two, uh, actually three more up. Uh, uh, you have to bear with us. Uh, we have a lot of people who want to participate. So. My name is Jacqueline Sorbin Johnson, and I've got a very unique perspective because I worked in the disabled community before becoming disabled myself. Anyway, in the 50s, I worked for AHRC, which was the precursor to ARC. AHRC is Association for the Help of Retarded Children, and ARC is Association for uh, Retarded Citizens. I think that was what it was. Anyway, I retired in 83, so it's hard for me to keep up with all the letters in the alphabet game. But anyway, an interesting point is in 1972, I worked for Group Health. And at that time, we had an early intervention program for neonatal deafness. I'm glad to see so many interpreters here for the deaf today. But anyway, um, I was in charge of screening the neonates for congenital deafness from 1972 until I became disabled in 77. I did not retire until 83. But I just thought I would let you know about that since it's not well documented. Hmm. Thank you. Good. Now, uh, I, uh, this gentleman had a question down here. Oh. Actually, I'd like to um, go back to the earlier question about institutionalization, and I'd just like to add some thoughts on that subject and see if that sparks anything else from the panelists. Uh, my name is David Griffiths, by the way, and I just wanted to say that it's, it's important to recognize um, when you're looking at institutions and looking at eugenics, 
to, to understand the timing of all of this and to realize that eugenics began to come into play at about the same time that um, corporate capitalism was gaining a great deal of power in this country and uh, colonialism, you know, American colonialism on the international um, stage. And Mr. Largent, you mentioned colonies. And I, I can't believe that more people don't recognize the, the, the parallel there. And, and, and see the institutionalization of disabled people as a form of internal colonialism. And when you look at some of the documents from the time period, and you see that the people who were, who were setting up these colonies were using Indian reservations as their models, which by the way were also provided the models for Hitler's concentration camps. And then the next big phase in, in the development of eugenics and the development of new ideas in institutions came in the 1930s with the rise of fascism in both Europe and in the US. And you know, we have to look at the similarities between the, the different groups that were targeted in the US by the eugenics movement and the different groups that were targeted by the Nazis. And they were basically all the various groups of people who posed some sort of threat to the fascist capitalist powers that be. Um, and I'm kind of bouncing around here, but remember that most of the funding for the American eugenics movement came from the, the big capitalists of, of the day and their, and their families. You know, the eugenic records office was set up with $850,000, I think, from Mary Harriman's personal fortune. And, and it just goes on and on and on and on and on. Um, so I'll stop there and Thank you. Does anybody want to add yeah, anything? Yeah, Ileana. Um, you know, I'm glad that you mentioned that because um, one of the things that I had found in my own research through from the 1870s all the way until the 1920s is that most or most of these institutions uh, where individuals were sent to, um, they were actually channeled back into labor projects. So it's important to understand how, then how this, the language of uh, social reform and legal on eugenics also serve as a way to organize labor, a channel labor and distribution of labor. Okay. Good. We have a question here. Well, there's, uh, there's two issues. One's for, uh, for Michael, actually. Uh, it's about uh, what we're talking, we've talked about how it breaks down by state, the eugenics movement, uh, how it breaks down by, you know, uh, universities and the programs that were offered. But one thing that has been mentioned is how it breaks down by discipline. And the reason I bring that up is because uh, as an anthropologist, I'm trying to write the history of disability and anthropology, which always begins in 1934 with Ruth Benedict's study. As though the history of disability and anthropology and you know, uh, the eugenics movement were discrete you know, periods of time, even though anthropologists are well remembered for opposing the ideas of race, they aren't as well remembered for abandoning people with disabilities. Um, that's one issue. The other issue is the uh, the idea that we have, uh, uh, at the same time we have this eugenics movement, we also have the startup of uh, vocational rehabilitation programs, and they start with the, uh, the Vocation Act of 1917. Um, so we have this clear division in policy toward people with congenital disabilities and people with acquired disabilities. So uh, those are just two issues that, you know, I kind of wanted some discussion about, you know, about the uh, disciplines was interesting to me personally. Thank you. Wonderful. Anybody would like to address that on the panel? 
Oh, the, uh, the, the uh, making a point about the relationship. So the differences between disciplines in relationship to uh, treatments of eugenics. I can address briefly the, some of the arguments in the 1930s in which there was sort of contestation over whose turf eugenics belonged on. Uh, and what was interesting is that as eugenics acquired social and political currency in the late 20s and early 1930s, these um, uh, disciplines that were trying to become increasingly um, professionalized uh, and find a place in American public policy actually debated among them over who gets to be in charge. There's a similar debate that happens in the 80s and 90s between the biologists who say that the secret of life can be discovered by the Human Genome Project and the physicists who are saying, no, the secret of the universe can be figured out by the superconducting super collider. And it's essentially a science funding debate between Weinberg and um, uh, E.O. Wilson, where they're, they're going at each other in the 80s and 90s. You see the same thing happening in the 20s and 30s between anthropologists and sociologists on the one hand and uh, psychologists and biologists on the other hand. And uh, the psychologists and biologists, for the most part, tended to, um, to, to argue that eugenics was a solution to the social problems uh, because they had a biological basis to it. Whereas the anthropologists and sociologists said, well, no, these are social problems. And as social problems, they're within our purview of professional advice. And they actually debated for four or five years about that. And who, the, the group that ended up being the sort of mediator for it was, were American physicians. American, the American Medical Association finally stepped in in the late 30s and sort of said, well, this is really a mostly biological issue, but secondarily a, 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 social, uh, a social issue. Um, and it's all really playing out in a debate over who can best tell public policymakers the solutions to these complex um, social problems. Um, that's when I see it at its height, is in the, is in the late 20s and early 30s. And they do, they do say they're speaking for their discipline, which, is, uh, which uh, uh, it's interesting because you see the science funding tied to the ability to assert their um, unique professional uh, power to solve these social problems. Yeah. Thank you, Mark. Uh, one of the, one of the, let oh, me just sorry. comment really briefly. One of the, one of the things um, that ma makes me think of is, is one of the things, one of the most interesting things that I've found in my study of the history of eugenics is that um, this whole idea of the nature nurture debate or nature versus nurture is much more complex than most people think and most people portray. Um, from from the mid 19th century on, um, it, it it people have been not quite as dogmatic as, as scholars would portray them as being yeah. in their scholarship uh, in, in this debate. And, and there's always been a tension among the different disciplines. Uh, and there's always been a tension between uh, is it environment or is it hereditary or, or biological? And, um, and that's, a, that's a tension that I think is still with us um, today. And I think it's one of the ways in which we can really, some, we can really draw uh, really stark uh, comparisons or parallels between sort of current debates and, 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 and then sort of historicizing them um, throughout the late 19th and 20th centuries. Thank you, Michael. Um, I, I'd like to hit this gentleman here. He's had his hand up for a long time. And then I want to go back. So those of you in the back who have been very uh, patient, I really appreciate it. Thank you. My name is Paul Miller. And I want to focus my question on, on who these people were who were being um, sterilized and how they came into the system. Um, so to speak. Um, were these folks who general GPs sort of introduced in and recommended to public health officials? Were they people who were born with disabilities? How did the eugenics movement treat people who at later in life, you know, develop the appearance or the apparentness of, 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 of disability? Um, how, how are people selected for entry into, so to speak, the program? Good. Does anybody have any specific institutional insights around I, that? I'm, I'm hesitant to say this, but I'm going to try it. Um, every single person who was sterilized was a ward of the state. That is, every person found themselves um, in a situation in which they no longer had their freedom to make personal 
medical decisions they were either prisoners as were the case of most sterilized men or they were in either mental health or some sort of welfare institution in the case of generally in case of women more so in the case of women than men and prisons more so in the case of men than women but that becomes the the very lever or the very fulcrum against which they're they're capable of of being pushed into the system because they've lost that and we you know I talked earlier about the commitment stuff or the quarantine stuff and you 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 don't seem to be capable of being sterilized unless you are first in the system as a ward of the state in some way and I I think maybe we can find cases in which that might not be true but that seems like 99% of it to me I think Mark's very correct in saying that the state played a very powerful role in the post World War two period however many many middle-class women sought out sterilization and middle-class men sought out sterilization to to control their fertility as well but I think largely I mean we have to look at sort of the rise of the modern welfare state things like juvenile courts and in Chicago there was even a morals court and various other systems that these the folks would sort of come in contact with the rise of social work as a profession where social workers are going to various homes at other places and visiting people that eventually sort of become entangled in the web of class as Snyder would say in his book but I think in the post World War two period there we see much more sort of what people might call in quotes a voluntary sterilization and these people are aren't wards of the state okay wonderful can I add something? oh yeah please Stephen the a group that's being forgotten here are the Native Americans yeah. there was massive sterilization pushes and mm -hmm. up until the 70s and beyond so um, can I also uh, in the you know I'm not a student of uh, sterilization per se so I may be a little bit uh, fussy on the details however um, sterilization in the case of, of Puerto Rican women on the island um, it it w they were never institutionalized women. Uh, these were women living in rural communities around the hospitals that had been established, hospitals that had been established with funding from missionaries, uh, sometimes military funding, government funding. There were the creation of social work teams to be sent out in the community to recruit women. Um, so they were not they were not institutionalized women. Later on, by the 1950s, and when we have a, a larger process of industrialization on the island, uh, many manufacturers, then private manufacturers, establish birth control offices. But in reality, these offices became also a, a place for encouraging women to sterilize, women who had become then the heart and soul of the manufacturing uh, modernization project. So. We had a question in the middle here uh, earlier. The hand up has been up. Uh, if you could get a microphone there please and then uh, I know we have one in the back too and then I'll come back to forward here and, and you've had your hand up here for a while too okay okay right there okay sorry I missed you over there okay. all right thank you so much uh, for your time today my name is Caitlin Morrison and I am an admissions counselor here at the University of Washington I have a question regarding this original law that you were speaking about that is still somewhere in the books uh, this idea about uh, the sterilization of sexual offenders. And I know that this is still happening in some states, and I'm wondering how can our understanding of this history of eugenics inform the current discussion and events surrounding uh, sexual offenders and sterilization, whether it's an option to reduce sentencing or, um, yeah, that's pretty much my question. So who, is anybody on the panel here? So specifically you wanna know about. Uh, so how can we apply this discussion to. to uh, for for uh, criminal offenders. Yeah, and, and in some states this is still happening. Okay, okay, good. Does, it, does anybody on the panel here or anybody in the audience maybe have a perspective on that? 
All right, I can project, but I can't record. Uh, I'm Louis Musso. Some of you may have read uh, a paper that I did some time ago on this very subject. And uh, the, what I'd like to say about the 1909 law and its applicability now, um, in 1993, when my paper was picked up by the Associated Press and uh, got really an extraordinary, I thought, amount of publicity around the country. I, I still get calls from newspaper reporters uh, five or six times a year uh, wanting me to comment on things in their states. In any event, when it, that made it very obvious to people, including legislators, that the 1909 law was still on the books, absolutely no one, no one in the legislature, no one in anywhere, as far as, I'm, as far as I know, ever raised the issue of repealing it. In fact, the contacts I received from members of the legislature were how, gosh, we didn't know this. Is there anything else? <laughs> you know, they, were, they, were they were completely in favor of keeping it on the books. So um, that, uh, I, think, I think, illustrates that you know, in the, in the broader community, the concept is, is still very, very acceptable. And there's a, often a big disconnect between the people who are members of state legislatures and the people who are members of academic communities or special uh, interest communities. So um, I don't know what to do about that, but it's an illustration of, of how it actually still applies. Thank you, Robert. We had a question over here. It's been drawn to my attention. Could, could we have the microphone for you for, for the television purposes? Thank you. Hi, my name is Cheryl, and I work at the University of Washington as a graduation specialist. And um, I'm not a professional in this area at all, but I do have a very personal interest. And I have sort of a question and kind of a consciousness to throw out there that may be something we may all want to consider throughout the course of the day. First of all, um, <clears throat> I'm adopted, and I found out when I was in my 30s that I was half Greek. And when I proceeded to um, find the pathways to my personal history as an identity, I found out that um, my father's father came over with his brothers um, from uh, a, an island called Kefalonia from Greece during the great wave of immigration back in the early 1900s. And one of their brothers was, they all went through Ellis Island, they came, all came over on the boats, and one of them was actually not allowed into the States. Um, and I believe he had to settle in Canada. So um, given that information and also trying to follow um, the genetic course of my own history. And as, as I get older, finding out what I may be prone to, what kind of strengths I have in my family. Um, I, I pose this question, how has um, either di di disability either shaped our politics um, over the course of history in the United States, how has what we perceived back then as a strength to um, marginalize or control or exploit people that we labeled as weak maybe done just the opposite and limited us as a nation um, in terms of our creativity, our genetic variability, um, if that issue could be addressed, I'd be very interested in it. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. Anybody on the panel? Well, 
it's a huge question, and um, I don't really know where to begin. But um, disability, I think, has profoundly affected a lot of aspects of, of, of public policy, and especially immigration law, um, and obviously um, things like sterilization laws. And um, I mean, I, we can only begin to think about how things may have possibly been different um, if, if, if these things were recognized. But as historians, I don't think we can, we can do that. We can't be sort of presentist in our thinking and project um, our sort of current beliefs on the past. We need to really look at the sources and, and see what, what they're telling us and sort of remain true to the sources of the time, I guess, would be my answer. I don't know, does anybody want to add anything to that? Anybody else got anything, Dan? Okay. We have, uh, I would like to, there, there's uh, somebody at the very back who's had his hand up for Concentrate on now, or was that something that there's research in both fields that occurred during that time? That makes sense. Yes, so you, your question is about the, both the positive and the negative, the... the Nature versus nurture. Or, well, um, was it focused more on the nature or the nurture? So was it preventing people from being bad parents or was it preventing people oh, from passing on bad genetics? Okay, yeah. In but, theory. Um, I think the nature-nurture distinction is a presentist framework on which we have analyzed the history of eugenics. Um, and I, you know, I think Stephen probably could talk about this as well, when looking at the rhetoric of um, uh, advocates of eugenics, especially at the, at the beginning of the movement uh, in the things like the American Breeders Association. The fact is, is that uh, a plant cannot grow without a seed. Right. And a seed cannot grow without soil. The idea of separating nature and nurture is silly. And in fact, uh -huh. this notion about um, the idea that, uh, you know, these are just nature people and the nurture people are really right um, is a, an artifact of mid-20th century attacks on um, uh, some of the politics and policies and, and to a certain degree the scientific claims of a, a group of um, genetic determinists. But Luther Burbank had, you know, great discussions about how, you know, the, the finest seed cannot grow to the, its fullest potential in sandy soil and the richest soil will never produce a superior plant from an inferior seed. Uh, and when I teach this, I often talk about how we use the word inheritance in two completely different ways. I mean, I, I inherited my father's blue eyes, and I inherited my father's truck. But I don't have his eyes on a jar in my desk the way that I have the keys to his truck in my pocket. Like, they're two different things. We use the same term, and the fact that the eugenicist and, and Galton, when he coined this term, would never have distinguished between these two things. Good, I have my father's eyes because I'm my father's son. I have my father's truck because I'm my father's son. And my familial relationship to my father is as relevant for my social qualities as it is for my genetic qualities. And they would have never distinguished between these things. They, you can't distinguish between them. They don't exist independently. So this idea that, oh, well, you know, it, we're 40 percent nature and 60 percent nurture, these are sort of silly 20th century artifacts, late 20th century artifacts that just don't, aren't relevant to the people we're studying at all. Yeah, and I think, I think Mark's absolutely right. And I would just like to add to that that I think that eugenicists and people who or even believed in, in the idea of eugenics consistently blurred the lines between nature and nurture or environment and, and heredity um, throughout the, the 20th century. It was much more sort of complex than, than people make it seem to be. There was, I mean, scholars of eugenics often try to sort of parse out was you know, were eugenicists Lamarckian in their thinking or Mendelian in their thinking? And it was always sort of this, this odd combination of both. Um, and I'll just state a really brief anecdote from my own research. Dr. W. A. Evans, who was a physician in, in Chicago in the, in the first half of the 20th century, said that uh, race betterment, which was what they called it back then, it, um, it was, was a two-horse cart. And that, uh, it, so in other words, it, it required both environmental thinking and uh, what they would call then uh, eugen eugenic or genetic thinking as well. Can I add 
that. Um, it, that also is not only seen in terms when you read uh, a eugenicist treaty and you actually find that they are much more complex than what we think in terms of the nurture versus nature. But when we want sort of zero in into looking at the sort of policies and programs and events that are put into place at the same time that, for example, a municipality is encouraging sterilization, it's also implementing parenting classes and is also implementing a competition about mother of the year. So there is a wide array, a wide catalog then of practices that one could say are trying to tackle in both things. So. Mm -hmm. so I, Mark mentioned the early rhetoric. Um, there were some eugenicists that were foaming at the mouth eugenicists that, that appreciated no nature, uh, no nurture, I mean, it was all genetics, and, and that, that's very true. Uh, along the lines in the early growth, too, there was a euthenics movement and an aristogenics movement. They were both positive. Aristogenics was, was the very positive end of it. Euthenics was improving the environment that people grew up in, and, and they sort of got absorbed into positive eugenics and went away. Stephen's right. There are there are some people who are uh, assertively genetic. By and large, the eugenics movement's got discourse from from all sides. The place where I see it most clearly, and as, I, as I'm thinking about this, are the um, peop the scientists who are interested in advancing Mendelism as um, a, a valid expression of what happens in nature, uh, especially in the first years of the American Breeders Association, end up producing a body of knowledge that identifies very clearly the genetic basis for about two dozen different traits, things from eye color and, um, you know, the this, this stuff you learn in biology 101, you know, attached, detached earlobes, rolling your tongue, uh, but also for things, which are, there's no environmental portion to that at all. Um, also, um, remember Charles Davenport's the guy who figured out the first uh, genetic disease that's inherited in a simple Mendelian fashion, Huntington's chorea. Uh, and there are, there's no, there's no, and we would say there's no environmental component to Huntington's chorea. It's, it's a genetic disease. There's no environmental component to the color of my eyes. It's a genetic issue. But I think the broader public policy concerns for it mingled environment and heredity um, in such a um, thoroughly integrative way. And I think Michael's uh, notion that, you know, some of the stuff they talked about from a Mendelian perspective, the, the social and cultural things they did talk about from a, a, an extremely Lamarckian perspective, and they had no problem accepting two different ways of thinking about two different things that were intricately tied. And, and genetics was a very young science then, in the, the teens and even the 20s. Yeah, you great. didn't have departments of genetics. They were in zoology. Um, Laughlin and others were strict Mendelists. They believed there, were, there was a single gene for many of these traits. Love of the sea, thalassophilia was one. So uh, one final question, I'm sorry, uh, down here. Hi, my name is Kimberly Lewis, and I've been listening to this history about, uh, I mentioned the history of deafness, and uh, deafness in deaf institutions, not necessarily mental institutions, and I'm, there's so much negative rhetoric about what's going on there. And there's not a lot of information there, so I'm wondering about if you've heard of any sterilization attempts going on, a medical um, attempts of sterilization or not. Deaf people or any disabled person who's in an institution, but I'm deaf, so I'm particularly interested in the deaf perspective in various institutions. So are you aware of any sterilization attempts uh, like giving people medication to, you know, like when, you know, would they give them medication, would they sterilize them without their consent at some kind of operation that they didn't realize they were being sterilized, that kind of thing. So I'm just wondering on that, I'm, I'm, I don't know, so I'm just wondering on that line if you know of anything about that kind of attempt. I think it happened quite often, um, more, well, I shouldn't say quite often, more often than we were able to document um, or think about um, Joanne and I were actually talking about this earlier. Um, people would go in for ap so-called appendectomies. Um, Kluchin in her book, Fit to be Tied, actually <coughs> refers to something that women in the South called Mississippi appendectomies, which is they would go into the hospital and they would be sterilized. Uh, and it would be, they would be told they were receiving an appendectomy. Um, 
and also, and, and, and it happened in, uh, in institutions as well. If uh, women um, gave birth in an institution, sometimes they would also be sterilized at that time as well. It's, it's very difficult to document, though, um, though because they were, were never really recorded as sterilizations. And I can't speak to the deaf question. Thank you very much.